What up, YouTube? It's your boy, Banks. And we back in the building, you feel me? It's True Talks. Because True Talks, all right? Let's get straight right into it. So you already know it's the playoff push. The last, you know, um, 20, 15 to 20 games, you know, uh, left in the season is always, you know, when everything gets more, teams are more acclimated, teams are trying, teams are obviously trying to contend. Teams that are already don't have to worry about no playing are trying to be a well-oiled machine, playing their best basketball, ending the season. So they're obviously trying and they're locked in, less mistakes, all of that, right? So this is a beautiful time in basketball period. And, you know, is obviously <clears throat> at the same time as March Madness. So it's just March Madness period because that's, you have the March Madness and you have the playoff type basketball atmosphere. Like you see a lot of game winners. You're seeing a lot of clutch games. You're seeing of, you know, just more intensity overall. So always, you know, you love to see that. And that's always, this is why it's always the favorite time of the year for basketball fans and hoop fans in general. So, you know, you got to love it, obviously. But we're going to talk about the Raptors. Obviously, you know, <clears throat> they've been going on a, they had a couple of, Maybe I maybe I think it was a three game. I don't know. Let me check the actual win streak that it actually was before I, you know, what I mean, they had a little <clears throat> for a while because I haven't been uploading from time. You know, we've been kind of sporadic. Obviously, you know, life is happening. But, you know, it was a four game winning streak. They lost one, 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 lost one, 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 you know, that split the back to back with the Wizards. Then they lost three to the Nuggets, Clippers and the Lakers. That's just a tough three game road trip anyways. You know, uh, they were on a five-game road trip, but a tough three-game road trip that they lost. We lost by five, lost by eight, lost by ten. So they were in close proximity, got home and beat the Nuggets, and they're on a two-game winning streak now after they just beat the Thunder. So let's dissect what's happening. Obviously, the Raptors have bumped up to the ninth seed. They're only, I think, one and a half games behind the Hawks. The goal is to get them outside the play-in, but, you know, that'll kind of be tough, especially when you look at it from, you know, just the perspective of, especially, you know, the stand-ins when you see it. Brooklyn's at the sixth seed. They're 11 games back, and the Raptors are, what, five games back of Brooklyn. So that will be very, very tough to actually achieve. The best-case scenario for the Raptors would be getting the sixth seed, but, you know, if they were to be in the play-in, obviously get the seventh or the eighth seed. So you minimize the amount of chances you lose. It's one versus two, right? If you're nine and ten, if you lose once, you're out. If you're eight or seven, seven or eight, then you have to lose twice to get eliminated. So that's obviously the better scenario and better situation, ideally, for the Raptors to be in if they were to be in the play-in. They don't want to be nine or ten. Right now, they're nine. The objective is to get to seven or eight. Seven or eight, that's just that's where you want to be, right? So obviously, moving forward, they, they could definitely do that. Only one and a half games behind eighth seed, so that's definitely doable. Uh, and it's, that's the Atlanta Hawks. So. Just dissecting their their last couple of games, um, you know, especially the the two game winning streak. I just something I don't want to highlight the most out of this is definitely um how OG's been playing. OG's been playing extremely efficient. He's been just playing. He, he's been having aggression, but it's not like outlandish aggression. Aggression, you know, where it's like it's out of out of character or where it's like it's out of the offense. It's still within the flow, and that's what I've been urging and preaching for OG to be doing. Since the season was coming in, I'm like, you could easily average 20 within the flow of this system that the Raptors have. Obviously, you're not the focal point. I already know that this is a limited old version of OG we're going to be getting regardless. When you play with the Raptors and the way they're playing, when they have Pascal initiating a lot of the offense, and then if not, it's not Pascal, it's mainly Van Fleet as well, and Scotty. They're the top three ball handlers for the most part. Then Trent still got to get his, you know what I'm saying? And then OG still got to get his. OG falls back to like the fourth, fifth man in terms of the offensive flow, like in terms of the usage, like he's always going to be at the back end. But you could still be aggressive in the back end. This is exactly how KD has existed throughout his whole career, why he's that elite and that efficient. He can play wherever system he's in. He can get majority of the shots, not whatever. He's still going to be aggressive when he gets it, pumping one dribble pull. He could not touch it for the whole possession. And then they could just pass it to him with five seconds left on the clock. Because he's in the corner, pump fake, two dribble, pull, bucket. Like, he doesn't need much. He doesn't need rhythm. There's no such thing. And that's the that's the most elite off-ball player that you could see and compare your game and kind of model your game and strive for greatness to, uh, you know, implement or duplicate in terms of in the NBA right now, probably ever. 
is KD because you just see how he plays. So OG obviously being a two-way player and being a great defender and, you know, doing the little things and all that type of stuff. You know, obviously Kawhi also can play off the ball as well too. He plays on the ball, but for the most part when he's with the Spurs, he won a finals MVP by playing majority off the ball. So there's there is a lot of blueprints and a lot of player types out there that you could follow that OG could definitely fit and he could add more aggression in that play style or in that in that offensive flow where where he is on the hierarchy of that offensive flow. And that's what I've been trying to urge for OG. You don't have to wait for Pascal to get injured to now increase your shot attempts because now you get the ball more and they're giving you PNR and more opportunities and more you just ball handling duties because someone is out. You can't just wait for that. You have to be aggressive. You have to be, you know, basically be being try to be efficient, even if you're not efficient, just being aggressive in your flow, in your situation. And when you get it, yes, you can make the right pass one more to the corner and he might be more wide open, but you're also wide open too. Sometimes you just gotta shoot it. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially if that guy's close on, he can't get to both of you. My open shot's the same as your open shot. Just shoot it. Now, if he's close and he's recovering, then you one more. Obviously, play team basketball. You still play team basketball. But that's that's where that's what I mean by aggression. There's opportunities where you could take yourself first and be aggressive in those aggressive moments or in those opportunities that you're still getting it within the flow. You're not forcing. It's still within the flow. You didn't demand the ball by going into the post and clogging the whole offensive flow and offensive set. You still spaced out but the ball now gravitated towards you. Now you be aggressive ha, 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 in just quick, quick decision, you know, quick decision opportunities, quick decision making, just period, three seconds, two seconds or less. And that's when you, that's what it means by being aggressive in that flow, in that opportunity. And that's what I've been urging for OG to be doing. And I said, if he does that, I already know the Raptors level of winning, even though it's unconventional with this whole play style clash with Pascal and, and Scotty that I've been saying where I said one of them has to go for the Raptors to elevate to a real contender. You're not going to be able to contend with that play style clash. It's just it's un, it's just it, it's not it's the same thing with Westbrook and LeBron. That play style clash, there's only so much you could do with it. And it's not going to be a contending version, especially in this NBA when other teams have spacing, et cetera. You're at a disadvantage. So the spacing is not an issue. But when you have two guys who can't really space with each other. And everybody around that is not necessarily like doesn't matter with the rhythm, with the skill, whatever. It's not going to be able to work at the level it should work. You know what I'm saying? It could still work. Like Pascal and Scott, if they were playing with Brooklyn before, we see how Clax and, 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 and Ben Simmons were playing together. Both can't shoot with KD, Kyrie, and Joe Harris or Royce O'Neal or whoever. They still went on a 12-game winning streak in this same season that obviously it went all right. And... That's because those two guys are so skilled. They could score with no space in double team. It don't really matter that now they're going to get doubled in certain situations that now you pass the Clax and now Clax are throwing alley to Ben Simmons. They could even play dunker spot, have no space in. Ben Simmons could be in no space in situation. It's not going to affect the, the skill set or just affect the output of those two guys. And that's where you see that also with Westbrook also playing with the Clippers, right? You're seeing that even when they sag off Westbrook or whatever, it's not affecting Kawhi and PG's ability to score or efficiency or anything like that. It's literally not canceling them. Same thing with Draymond when he's in Golden State. His non-ability, Glooney and Draymond playing together does not affect Steph and Clay, Jordan Poole, whoever. Like, it doesn't affect them because of the ability, where they can score, how they could score, et cetera. If anything, now you using them as a screen and you sagging off that, you're going to open it up more for me. Like, there's benefits within the lack of space and that you have to dissect it when you're looking at it from a chess match perspective or a breakdown perspective. There's a lot of benefits that those unconventional lack of shooters could present as well, right? So it's just only works if, they have, if they're playing with guys who have that skill. But if you're playing with someone who's clashing with you, the exact same version of you, like LeBron and Westbrook, that's where, like, they're not going to be maximized. You're both... Like one of you off the ball is going to be drastically affected than the person with the ball, vice versa. If LeBron is off the ball all the time with Westbrook dribbling, going downhill, LeBron's buckets is going to get canceled. Buckets is going to get canceled. Everything in just space and he's going to get canceled by more than half. And that's what you're seeing with Pascal and Scotty, which is why rarely you see them both go off in the same game. It's just is not is not it's just rarely do you see it. It doesn't mean it can't happen matchups etc for the team you're playing but when you're playing contenders and you're playing great teams rarely are they both going to go off in the same game so that's where i'm like okay you know 
I understand that that play style clash happens and they're going to go to Pascal and Scotty just because of the play style clash clash. You're going to get more opportunities with those two guys having the ball. So one, so the other one isn't affected or just for the offense to work better when you can't have both of them off the ball. So one of them has to have the ball or be involved in the PNR or whatever. Now that takes away more so from OG in terms of his hierarchy in when he would get it, et cetera. Like now he's even more of a backseat because those two guys have to get it just for the offense to flow with how this offense is designed by nurse. So when you look at it from that perspective, I always understood that OG was not going to get the rock like that, like that, like that. We understand that. Like for in terms of what OG could really be. Like other teams see. That's why his value was high for the trade trade deadline, et cetera. Like other teams really know what OG could really be if he was to get the rock more, especially his defense is already guaranteed. If he was to get the rock more and have more of a flow and have more rhythm and have more touches, more usage, he could be a whole different guy. That's what you saw Jeremy Grant be with the Pistons, et cetera. Like, that could be a whole different – we don't look at him. We could look at him different now. Like, he's an all-star caliber player. OG's an all-star caliber player if he's in the right situation, 1,000%. But, again, that's where I'm like, okay, that shouldn't dictate how aggressive you – as a hooper, OG, forget what they're sussing you and you're not in the best situation for you individually to be maximized. We get that. But as a hooper, you have to maximize your situation regardless. And this is why you look at the Kawhi when he was with the Spurs, the Katie, wherever he's been with. Maximizing your situation is not the best version of yourself, but you're not far off it because you're that elite. You could play any version of yourself is still an elite version. And that's where I wanted OG to, you know, improve and get to. And you're starting to see that. Like, you're starting to see him. You know, even in spot up situations, he's catching the shoot, he's getting it, he's getting it off the catch and shoot. Okay, you know, I'm a ball handle. Come set me the screen, <laughs> step back off the PNR or even ISO situations, playing the drop coverage, the bigs. Now you pull in the gap, like he's playing spin, 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 step backs. Like he's playing with a confidence, regardless of the rhythm. He's just playing with an extreme confidence, which confidence and aggression kind of go hand in hand. There's only a certain amount of aggression you could have if you're lacking confidence. When you have extreme confidence, you're always going to be more aggressive. You're going to maximize every scenario that you're in. Even if you only get five touches, those five touches, I'm actually going to get nine shots because even though I got five touches, like, how do I explain it like this? People just look at it as, oh, he got five shots. Five shots doesn't necessarily mean five touches. So if I got five touches and it equaled out to five shots, that's beautiful. I maximize my situation. But a lot of times people like, oh, you only had five shots. If you really look at the game, that guy could have touched it 15 to 20 times, but he only took five shots because he was literally taking a back seat and he wasn't aggressive. So he only took the five guaranteed shots that he can't even avoid taking. Like it was all someone drove and kick it to him. He's wide open. You better shoot that kind of those are his five shots. But you did get it in situation when you got it. They kicked it to you. You didn't have a catch and shoot shot. So now you kicked it back right to the guy. That's not being aggressive. That's literally you, like, you're acting like you're just a corver. You're a shooter. You're a capono. You're a guy who just, you can't put the ball on the floor. You just get it, catch a shoot. If the catch is not there, hit him back and run your offense, fam. That's where, like, when you dissect the game, when I'm looking at being aggressive, OG was doing it. He'll get the rebound, give it to Flam Vliet as if you can't bring up the ball and score in transition. Like, Jalen Brown be doing that bare times. This is, this is how you maximize yourself. I know I might not be getting that much in the half court right now, I got an offensive, I got a defensive rebound. I'm pushing the ball. Jalen Brown does that forever. OG could do that easily. Westbrook be doing that. I mean, half court, I'm barely touching the rock. When I get the rebound, I'm gone, fam. <laughs> no questions asked. You, this is what I'm talking about. So OG, like you're starting to see him be more aggressive. Even when he gets it and there's nothing, there's no catch and shoot. Okay, I'm going to go to work real quick. Try, you know, I'm going to still be aggressive. And that's what I'm talking about. And you're seeing OG do that. Even it's a limited version that we're seeing, regardless because of the play style, he's maximizing it where you're seeing like his output is very is beautiful, man. Like I just wanted to highlight that because this is the OG I've been wanting to see, regardless of the wins or losses. Like just versus OKC, six for nine, extremely efficient, 66%, three for four from three, 75%, 17 points. Easy peasy. Like you could have nine shots and it feels like you had 15. That's what he just did right there. That's that KD package. That's that KD work. And then a game before that versus Denver, 10 for 14, 71% from the field, 4 for 8 from 350%, 3 
24 points. Light work versus the Lakers, even though they lost. He was cooking 12 for 14, 85% from the field, 4 for 6, 66% from three, 31 points, like three for three from the free throw line. Like beautiful basketball. Again, versus the Clippers, 7 for 11, 63% from the field. Like you see what's going on, 4 for 7 from three, 18 points. The other game, obviously, 3 for 7, 2 for 11. But you see the aggression is during the shot attempts. He's always taking around 10, 10-ish plus if you average it out, 10 above, which is good. Before, he wasn't always taking that. So you're starting to see an increase. Forget the efficiency, just an increase in aggression. And it doesn't have to be the shots. Just the fact that he's maximizing his opportunities and being aggressive, I love to see that. And that's just going to make the Raptors better. Forget the wins and the losses just for OG's sake and the team's sake. Him being that is always going to be better version of the Raptors that they're going to get, especially coming into playoff time. He's doing it at the right time. So tip your hat off to OG. It's beautiful to see that. Obviously, we also know that Red Van Vliet has been putting in work as well, too. You know what I'm saying? Over the last couple. Um, we understand that as well. Uh, but like I said, like you, you like Pascal is he's Pascal's playing decent. He's playing all right. You know what I'm saying? Regardless, he's getting he's like he's going to get his opportunities. He's going to get those that he's getting, and regardless, it's about maximizing it, right? Um, Especially when you look at it from Van Vliet, his shooting at times is horrendous, but I don't really look at his shooting as horrendous because he's playing in a different role that he's not really used to. He's getting better at it. He's getting more usage at it, and there's more balance sometimes, but still, he's more so like it's Pascal's offense first, everything else second. That's how it normally is. He's 5 for 17, 9 for 16, 5 for 12, 4 for 12, 3 for 9, 13 for 22 versus them. We're going to work 8 for 17. Like you could see that, you know, when he's more, the more comfortable he is in certain games, he shows it out in his efficiency. The other games, like it's just a rhythm thing. Van Vliet has never been a guy to have no rhythm and still just be cooking. He's never been that guy. Like that's not who he is. If you give him the rock more and he's having the ball and he's ball handling, he has rhythm and he's playmaking, he's running the offense and he's feel comfortable and confident in that, you're going to see the best version of Van Vliet. If he's not doing that, you're going to have an inconsistent Van Vliet. So that's why I don't really overreact to the inconsistent Van Vliet because I know this isn't the true Van Vliet in terms of what he should be when he was an all-star. You saw what he was in his consistency. You know, he's never shot the greatest percentages, but he's he was consistent in his output because he has an idea and a confidence in, okay, I know what I'm going to be consistently doing every game, so rhythm is not going to be an issue. When it's always different every game, some guys just aren't, they're not, it's, you have to appreciate the guys where rhythm doesn't matter. That's a small select few. Most players in the NBA, rhythm matters. They're human. Rhythm matters. When rhythm doesn't matter, you're a different, you are so elite and you do this and you're so efficient and you're just so different that no rhythm is your rhythm. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Like, that's how different you are. Like, you not having the ball, like, you find, like, nothing affects you that you not having the ball is, you find rhythm in the no rhythm. Like, it's just different. It's, I can't explain it. That's the best way I could say it, but that's just a different level of breed. You get what I'm saying? And a lot of these players, I, I like, people always just, efficiency, efficiency. There's a lot of people just read stats, and they don't understand that there's levels of stuff. And there's just like you can't compare certain things to that. And that doesn't tell you the full the full side of the story. So with Van Vliet, it's a whole different thing. You see them come out and even say it. And I've been saying it from time. But for the most part, again, it's always been the Pascal show. That's how the Raptors been operating. Because, again, that's your best player. That the that That's what they feel is their best player. I don't think that he is. But that's what the Raptors feel is their best player. Um, I just think he's getting the ball the most. And he's getting it used. So he's going to eat in that. So he looks like the best player. But he, he actually isn't. But it's not a knock against Pascal. He's doing his job. He's doing what he's supposed to do. He's maximizing. This is his best individual season. Like, he's doing it. But like I said, if Pascal could be the best player on a team and could be and could be on a contender if you gave him the Milwaukee blueprint, everybody's shooting. You know, your bigs aren't really in the paint. You have bigs that could shoot, which is why you saw them when they had Gasol and Ibaka. That was the best team that Pascal was the leader of. All these other teams... You might get a best version of Pascal, but you don't get the best version of the team. When you had the best version of the team and the best version of Pascal, that was when they lost to the Celtics in the bubble. And that was when you had Gasol and you had Ibaka and they had three point shooting bigs and they had a lot of space for him in the paint. So it was literally the Milwaukee Raptors. That's what they were. And when you don't have that, Pascal can't be your best player if you want the team to be the best. So that's where I've always stood on that. 
And that's what you always see come to fruition. This is why they've always been bottom tier. Their best seed that they've had outside of not having bigs that could shoot like that or having no bigs, but having, you know, when they have this whole roster that doesn't fit Pascal as being your best in terms of the number one option, this is why they've been the highest seed they've got was the sixth seed. And they've been in the play in every other time or not. And that's where, and that's just the truth. You know what I'm saying? That's just where your eyes work. And it's just the truth. But Pascal, for the most part, like, see, you're going to get inconsistencies. You're going to get, see, so you go at 7 for 18, 6 for 16, 5 for 10, 8 for 18, 9 for 21, 5 for 13, 6 for 16, 9 for 19. Now, what the Raptors are doing, they're doing a better job of when he's off, they're kind of shifting their offense a little bit, which is why you see other guys get multiple touches. They're kind of, again, it's just read and react. That's what they're doing, which is why they're playing better. It po- They're having more wins, like, in the last since what? They've won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and lost one, two, three, four, five. They've won nine, lost, lost five. So they're doing better. They're more above five hundred for the last couple. Well, that's fourteen games, fifteen games. It would be they won nine, lost six. But for, again, for the most part, I'm I'm been seeing. Obviously, he's the focal point, and yeah, 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 he has the ball. He's getting all those shots, and, he, and just the shot attempts. That's not even how much you have it in your hand and how much you're actually passing, and everything's designed from you, et cetera. But for the most part, like I said, you got to look at it that they're still adjusting in that. Van Fleet will sometimes have it. This person will have it. This player will have it. Scotty will have it. OG will have it. Trent, like, they're doing more of a better job balancing that it's not just Pascal or die, which is what they were doing before. And obviously, rightfully so, when he is struggling here and there, you're forced to go a different direction too. So I just think that at the end of the day, the Raptors are playing good. Their half-court offense at times is just atrocious because they're going this way. They play this way, which is what I'm saying. If you remove from it, if it was up to me, if I was the coach of the Raptors, I would, because Pascal obviously is the face, it's hard to put him off the bench. I wouldn't do that, but I would split. Pascal and Scotty just starting out the game. I would definitely have to bring Scotty off the bench. Unfortunate, but I would bring him off the bench to sub out Pascal when he comes out, or sub out Pirtle. I would just have a three big man rotation, meaning Pirtle, Pascal, and Scotty are playing the four and five, and they all they interchange, all three of them. They interchange, so they sub out each other. Only two of them are in it. You won't have three of them ever in. I wouldn't do that because that's when you see the lack of offense at times. When you have Pascal, Scotty, and Pertle in, you're just like, God damn, it's only two shooters. Only OG and Pascal or or Van Vliet. And, like, it's just hard. It's hard. That's why their offense, they go in droughts. When they're playing great defense and they're in transition, that lineup is beautiful defensively. But when they're not getting stops and they have to score in the half court, they get exposed, which is why you'll see them. At times, even versus the Clippers, they're up 11-0 or whatever they're up. And then eventually it goes away and you find them tie game at half because they go through droughts and now they're down 10. It just it happens like that often, right? So, like, if they're not clicking defensively and they're not getting stops, that lineup just is not a great half-court lineup. You have three non-shooters. Like, that's it – could, it could get horrendous at times when you're watching it, especially when you're going to Pascal and you're trying to go, like, it's just horrendous. So then now – OG has to take a four shot or Van Vliet or even Pascal sometimes. Like, it's just Fugazi or Scotty sometimes. Like, it's just foolishness. So, I would split that up if it was up to me. And I would actually have Perto and Pascal at the four and the five. And I will be having Van Vliet, Trent, and OG. And that's what I will be doing. And obviously, off that, I will sub. I think Scotty will still play a lot of minutes, but there'll be times where they'll, Pascal will be out, now Scotty will be in, or now if Perto needs rest, you have Scotty in and you go small for that segment of time when Perto's not in, and that's when Pascal and Scotty could play together like how they used to, right? So, like, I would manipulate the lineup like that, and that's how I would work with it, and I think the Raptors would be better off at that because you have more shooters in, at least one in, and when you have two of those guys in, there's still three. You always have a balance of when there's two non-shooters, there's three shooters. When there's two non-shooters, there's three shooters. Now, if there's, you know what I mean? If there's one non-shoot, if there's uh four four shooters, then there's one. You know what I'm saying? But you're always, at worst, three shooters are in. Now, when you have now with lineups, they at worst, they have two shooters only in. At best, sometimes they have that. So that's what I would do if I was the, the Raptors coach. I would definitely do that. And, you know, from there, obviously, you know, you I think the Raptors would have a better outcome and a better output at least would be the seventh seed, sixth seed. I think they'll do way better. But Perto has been a blessing. 
He's been a blessing. He's been um just his just his positioning, rebounding, soft touch around the rim, screening. He also is now the ball goes in Van Vliet's hands more because now you have a pick and roll player, player like a roller, Gobert type of player with better offensive touch. You know what I mean? Now Van Vliet is by he's he's guaranteed to be used more, which is why you see him have better rhythm and stuff like that because Pascal running a PNR with Perto is more useless as opposed to if you need to. You, at times, you just have to use Perto. He has to set the screen. He can't, he can't, he can't be in a dunker spot the whole time, so he's going to have to set the screen. So now you're going to have to – you want him to set it on a Trent, on an OG, or on a Van Fleet as opposed to sending it on a, a Scotty or on a Pascal. So that's now – because of Perto's acquisition, you now have to use Van Fleet in a more traditional role than you had to before. So you're seeing that at times. That's why you see that balance in a steady diet at times with Van Fleet more than he used to because they're forced to because Perto's there. So when you look at it from that perspective, that's why sometimes they go away from Pascal more than they used to, which is why you see it is working in the wins. It's not that Pascal shouldn't get the rock and that means they win more. It's not I'm not knocking him. No. I'm just looking at the skill set and I'm looking at the team usage because honestly, Pascal playing off the ball and if he would just if he would just he worked on his catch and shoot more. And that's what he was doing with Kawhi. He was hitting more catch and shoot. He used to do this. He was hitting more catch and shoot. He'll get his isos depending on situational, and he'll score in transition, and he'll be backdooring and stuff like that. He played free roam. If he was going back to that, he would still average what he's actually averaging. It's just he wouldn't be the focal point. He wouldn't average it in a. He would average it in a different way, and that would help the team. It's just now when you were getting the ball for so long. Now it's like you can't make that guy go off the ball again more. It's the same thing, the Harden. That's the Harden situation. He's only going to go off the ball a little bit when Embiid has it in the post. But for the most part, I'm bringing it up. I'm still doing me. Now when he had to play with Kyrie and Katie, sometimes he's not bringing it up. Sometimes it, and he's like, he didn't, you know what I mean? It's, uh, you look more of a shell of yourself, especially when you only could play one way and you've been playing that way. So that's why I just, it's hard to make Pascal go back to that role that he played with Kawhi. And I don't think he has to. I just think there needs to be a balance where you merge two worlds, the off-ball Pascal with the on-ball cooking ISO Pascal. You could blend both of them, and that could be the best version of the team. Maybe not the best version of Pascal individually with assists and all of that, but of the team. And he's not going to be far off of, from the 25 points per game. He might average 23. But now OG's averaging 20. Now Van Vliet is above over 20. Now the trend is higher. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's going to maximize the team. So, honestly, like, again, this just... Again, what it comes down to, like I was saying, Pirtle's, um acquisition was definitely beautiful to see. Um, like he's just been snapping. He's just been snapping for the most part. And he's, he's been doing he's been doing a great job protecting the rim. Even though he get dunked on or whatever, he still continue, continue, continue. Like, you know what I'm saying? AC's been doing what? 16 and 12 in the last game, then 12 and 11 and 17 and 10, 8 and 11, 18 and 9, 14 and 5, 23 and 13. Like, 21 and 18, like he's been snapping, snapping. So, and he's been a great acquisition, right? Blocks, one block, two block, one block, two block, one block. He's been getting blocks. So, for the most part, he's been he's been a huge impact. So, we'll see how the Raptors transpire, how they continue to grow, how they continue to improve. They need they they can't have you know as <laughs> as the schedule shows. Let's see what what they're going with. Let's see what they're going with because as the schedule shows, when you look at the Raptors, at some point, you know what I'm saying, they're, you can't have some losses. You got to get streak. You got to streak up. You got to streak up. You know what I'm saying? You got to streak up. So, you know, they have Minnesota, then Milwaukee, then Indiana, then Detroit, then Washington, Miami, Philadelphia. You have some tough games. Boston, Boston, back-to-back, Milwaukee, then the season. Boston, Boston, Milwaukee. Like, they got some tough games. Like, so they really got to they gotta put in work on these next games. Like, none of these games is easy. Even Indiana, they ain't easy. Detroit maybe might be the easiest one. But anyone could beat you in this league. They're facing, other than Detroit, Charlotte, Charlotte, every other team other than those three teams is like they're playing for something. You know what I'm saying? Indiana isn't really, but they have Halliburton. Like, they hoop. You know what I'm saying? They hoop. So, for the most part, when you look at it, you just got to, yeah, actually, they are playing for something. They're only one game. They're outside the plane. They can still, yeah, they're not far out. Only Charlotte is the ones that is, like, far out, Charlotte and Detroit. 
So everybody else is playing for something, like I said. So Raptors really got their tests coming up. They got to obviously find a way to get it done, and we'll see how things transpire. You already know. It's true talks. It's true talks. Share, like, and subscribe. We out here. There's no doubt here. There's no drought here. You feel me? I appreciate y'all. You already know. And I'm out, man.